Shortly after 6pm on August the 4th, an explosion ripped through the port of Beirut. It killed more than 200 people, wounded over 6,500, and destroyed large parts of the city. Forensic architecture was invited by Madame Mass to examine open source information, including videos, photographs, and documents, to provide a timeline and a precise 3D model to help investigate the events of August the 4th. The model is available via this link. The first photograph of the warehouse on fire was uploaded to Twitter at 5.54pm. We carefully geolocated this photograph by identifying the key buildings and calculated the camera's cone of vision. In this image, we identified the location of the source of the smoke plume at the northeast corner of Warehouse 12. Smoke plumes are continuously transforming and have a unique shape at every moment. We modelled the plume at this crucial stage to help synchronise other videos without a timestamp. A video shot at around the same time from one of the balconies of the residential tower building shows the same source of fire, clearly, on the same side of the warehouse. The shape of the plume and the heat source suggests that the fire had evolved. Another video, starting at 5.58pm from the nearby St George Hospital, provides 10 minutes of uninterrupted footage of the warehouse. Within two minutes, the smoke thickens and its colour changes to a darker shade. According to Gareth Collett, a UN explosives analyst we consulted, this suggests that the material burning inside the warehouse has changed. At 6.07pm, a new intense heat source appears on the other, northwestern side of the warehouse, here, followed by a different, larger plume. The sparks that follow suggest the presence of small explosive charges, such as fireworks. 35 seconds later, at 6.08pm, a large spherical plume appears above the centre of the warehouse. According to the explosives analyst, the symmetrical shape of the sphere suggests that it's a single point explosion originating in one particular place within the warehouse and it's possible that as little as half of the 2,750 sacks of ammonium nitrate stored inside detonated. We use the shape of the two plumes from these explosions as metadata to synchronise the remaining footage. This video, taken from further back, provides an uninterrupted view of the events that followed. Within the span of 9 seconds, the spherical plume projected high into the atmosphere. Several tons of particulates thickened the air, and a red-coloured plume, 755 metres high, rose over the warehouse. We have thus identified four types of smoke plumes emanating from different parts of the warehouse within the space of these 14 minutes. The first plume, at 5.54pm, emanates from the northeast corner of the warehouse. The second plume, at 6pm, is from the same source point, but has a darker colour. The third plume appears on the northwest side of the warehouse, at 6.07pm. The final plume is developed from a spherical explosion located at the centre of the warehouse, at 6.08pm. Each of these smoke plumes, with their distinct shape and colour, provide indications as to the arrangement of goods in the warehouse, the way the fire developed, and the layout of what was stored inside. A close-up examination helps in understanding the evolution of fire inside the warehouse. Early footage shows smoke leaking out of every opening, including the windows and the ceiling vents. From this point, at about 5.56pm, the temperature inside the warehouse started rising rapidly. Oh, 
The smoke is visible as it changes colour to a darker shade. In this footage, from the east side, we stabilise the footage to reveal the full extent of the warehouse. The sounds of fireworks starts being heard at approximately 5.59pm. It shows that many windows and doors are shut. According to the expert, confinement creates hotspots, areas of high temperature in which ammonium nitrate can get close to its combustion point. As reported by media outlets, the fire brigade arrived approximately four minutes after an initial call was made to the station at 5.54pm. In this footage, taken by the fire brigade on their arrival to the scene, the sound of fireworks continues to be heard. The 2,750 tonnes of ammonium nitrate were unloaded to this hangar in October 2014. And, as early as December of that year, various port and customs officials warned of the dangers posed by its storage. Many subsequent warnings were issued. In February 2015, for example, a chemical forensics expert commissioned by the Lebanese courts to report on the state of the stored ammonium nitrate, described that 70% of the sacks were torn open, their contents spilling out, and some of the crystals had darkened. Leaked images from February 2020 indicate that the storage conditions had not improved. The sacks were still torn open, and their contents were still spilling out. The bay numbers visible in the ceiling allowed us to locate these bags in bay 9 and 10. The images show the presence of a container and a stack of wooden pallets. Another video, taken on December 18th, released by news outlet Al Jadid, shows the state of ammonium nitrate bags stored at Bay 6 and surrounding Door 9. Stacked ammonium nitrate bags are blocking the entrance. Here, we can see the numbers for Bays 4 and 5. On the right of the videographer, between Door 9 and 10, a white coloured wall is visible, suggesting the presence of a small service room. Together, these videos and images allowed us to map a total of 243 bags of ammonium nitrate in the space. Given the location of the source of the spherical plume, here at Bay 8, the remaining 2,507 bags of ammonium nitrate should have been stored here, occupying almost 2,000 metres squared of space. But given the haphazard way the visible bags are stored, the space the entire stockpile occupied was likely larger. News reports suggest that in addition to the ammonium nitrate, the warehouse also stored 23 tonnes of fireworks, 50 tonnes of ammonium phosphate, 5 tonnes of tea and coffee, 5 rolls of slow burning detonating cord and 1,000 car tyres. Each of these materials burns differently. The combustion of tyres, for example, produces a dark and thick plume. According to the explosives expert, it could correspond to the dark plume we had located on the northeast corner of the warehouse, so we placed the tyres roughly here. The expert also told us that the white plume that appeared on the northwest of the warehouse corresponds to the ignition of fireworks. We therefore placed the fireworks roughly in this corner. From an engineering perspective, this is the spatial layout of a makeshift bomb on the scale of a warehouse awaiting detonation. According to Gareth Collett, ammonium nitrate is extremely difficult to detonate by fire alone. However, when confined and contaminated, this can lead to catastrophic detonation. It is sensitised by the presence of even the smallest quantity of additives and hence should be separated. We reviewed international standards for the storage of ammonium nitrate. 
Internationally accepted benchmarks include British regulations. According to British standards, stacks of ammonium nitrate must be limited to 300 tonnes and each stack must be at least one metre away from walls and other stacks. Australian standards are more stringent. Bags must be arranged in 500 tonne stacks but should be stored 890 metres away from the closest residential buildings. Using their equation to calculate safe distances, we can determine that a 2,750 stack of ammonium nitrate should have been stored 1,570 metres away from the closest residential building. NASA's damage map illustrates the extents of the blast. All these regulations prohibit the storage of combustible or explosive materials such as tyres or fireworks in proximity to ammonium nitrate. This fact highlights the substantial and sustained state negligence which led to the formulation of a makeshift bomb. Around 1,000 of the survivors and victims' families have called for an independent investigation and public access to all relevant documents. As the search for political and economic accountability for the explosion of August the 4th continues, forensic architecture and Madame Mass are making the model, the geolocated videos, and the source material used in the research publicly available via this link.